Good morning still if you're in Queensland. Good afternoon if you're not. Uh, welcome to this workshop with KPMG on circular economy. We have the best minds tackling this sector to join us here today. Before I get started and hand over the virtual mic to Kylie Little, I will just acknowledge the traditional owners on the land of which we meet. For me, that's the Gubby Gubby people, and I pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Please feel free to use the chat to ask questions. Uh, you can also jump off mic. There will be time for um, questions at the end, but we want to keep this interactive and, um, and really engaging. Kylie from High Growth Ventures, I'll pass over to you. Great, thanks Charlotte. Um, look, um, thanks everyone for joining and welcome to um, our second Lunch and Learn with the Climate Salad community. Um, if you came to the last one, you would know that um, we've designed these really as a way for everyone in the community to get access to the, the really rich expertise across the KPMG um, ecosystem. Um, we, have a, we have a ton of great experts in this business and we'd love to be able to get you the opportunity to share their sort of wise insights, expertise and um, understanding of what's happening in the market. Um, so for anyone, oh sorry my my room's gone dark. Um, for anyone that's not familiar with the High Growth Ventures team here at KPMG, we're, we're really focused on connecting founders um, and their teams to the services across KPMG they need to grow sustainably to save them time and money. So we're really focused on that startup space and understanding how we work with you as a startup, but get, at, get you access to the right expertise um, across the business, across different stages of growth. So spe specifically for us, really feeding you into, you know, bookkeeping, tax structuring, R&D, um, government incentive support, those sort of services, but we do do a lot more. So really happy for you guys to reach out to us, you know, whenever you need some support to understand how we can help and just so we can introduce you to, um, to what we can do for you. These sessions are very much designed for you to ask your questions. Um, so really sort of jump in, ask away, um, you know, find out what you need to find out from these guys um, as, as we go through. Um, initially, we'll do a bit of an intro with Sophie on, um, on the circular economy, and then we'll, we'll sort of go through a Q&A with Sophie and Mark. But then there's lots of room for you guys to ask questions throughout and at the end as well. So to kick off today's call, um, I really just want to introduce our, our two key specialists today. Um, so Mark Spicer joined KPMG's sustainability team in 2006. He's passionate about the intersection of capital markets and the environmental, social and governance performance of companies. Mark understands how the management of, of, of critical social and environmental issues such as climate risk, associated reporting and circular economy will play an increasing role in the ability of corporates to be successful. Mark works across all elements of the ESG and investment value chain from stakeholder member engagement, strategy design, policy and social environmental impact and valuation to reporting and assurance. So welcome to Mark. We have had a few little minor hiccups with Mark's mic. So just bear with us if we have to sort of Rob, get that working throughout can, the session. Can you hear me now? Does got that you. work? Perfect. Yeah, got, oh, happy day. <laughs> Got there in the end. Um, excellent. So welcome, Mark. Um, so Sophie Hollingsworth is with us, leads um, KPMG's Circular Economy Services. Um, Sophie is passionate about improving sustainability outcomes and igniting forward-focused circular business growth. Working with clients across the public and private sector, Sophie helps to co-develop and deploy circular strategies, utilise the principles of circularity to achieve net zero em emissions and enhance productivity and profitability, reduce resource costs and catalyse circular innovation. Prior to joining KPMG, Sophie held an extended Fulbright Fellowship sponsored by the United States Department of State, United States Department of State on water security in the Lake Chad Basin and was the environment and sustainability lead for Global Citizen, where she worked on various sustainability engagements across the USA, Norway, the Philippines, and Sub-Saharan Africa. Sounds like she knows what she's talking about to me. Um, so welcome, Sophie. Um, so to kick off, Sophie, given you've got such deep expertise in this space, um, we thought it'd be great for you to do a bit of an overview on, you know, circular economy, you know, what is it? What are you seeing? Just sort of get us, kick us off, get us running. Absolutely. Yep. No, thanks for that, Kylie. And um, thanks for the, the intro. What probably wasn't in there and probably the more relevant piece was um, I actually started out as a sailor. So I am um, by background, um, started out working on the high seas and it was there that I just saw so much plastic in the ocean when we were doing things like crossing the Pacific and you'd be on watch. And 
it wasn't all the time, but like every 15 to 30 minutes, you would see a piece of plastic floating by in the ocean. And it really caused me to trade in the sailing epaulets and um, go get advanced degrees in environmental science and really work on making more of an impact within the world. And what I think is so compelling about the circular economy is it's not just about doing good for the planet, for the inherent doing good. It's all about also the commercial outcomes because ultimately at the end of the day, we're not all going to be hippies living in a commune, eating chickpeas. We're still gonna need a really robust economy to make the world go round. And so that's where the circular economy I think has a really compelling impact and offering. So I'll just dive in a little bit on what the circular economy actually is first and some of those then trends that we're seeing and, and opportunities to, to make waves in this space. Cause I do think there's often the misconception that it's really just recycling 2.0. So my mission is to debunk that this afternoon. Um, so as you guys all know, we really have a predominantly linear system at this point. You know, we, we take resources, we turn them into something, we sell them, and then we predominantly throw them away. And our economy really cannot keep functioning like this in the long term. And it doesn't, I don't think it has to be this way. So the circular economy is really the opportunity to reinvent how we do business, how we live and, and redesign our systems. It's about the products we make, how we produce our food, how we manage our resources to kind of generate, I know it sounds like we're trying to change the world here, but really generate a new economy. It's not about just waste management and recycling. While those are certainly important pieces of the puzzle, it's really the last resort in the circular economy. It's, it's about a development paradigm that focuses on one, really designing out waste from the start. So we shouldn't be getting to the point where we're throwing things away keeping resources at their highest value and in use as long as we can, and then regenerating nature. So it's really about decoupling economic growth from finite resources. So within the circular economy, there are pretty much two different cycles. If you think about it as kind of like wings of a butterfly is what they call it, the, the butterfly diagram. There's a bio-based cycle and a technical cycle. And we're gonna keep this really simple. The technical cycle is basically anything that does not biodegrade. So metals, plastic, things that you would want to recover and put back into an economic system, typically through, through things like chemical recycling, recovery, remanufacture. Then you've got the biological side of the economy and that's things like food, wood, cotton, anything that if we design correctly would physically biodegrade when you return it back to the earth. And it's really important to distinguish between the two because the technical materials you want to put back into the economy, right? Like you don't want refrigerators or computers just lying on the ground disappearing because essentially, well, they might rust a little bit, but they're lost value, right? Like there are significant materials within those that we want to be able to keep and feed back into the economy. The bio cycle is very valuable just in a different way. For billions of years, organic material was fed back into the planet and regenerated soil, regenerated our um, various different ecosystem services, but we've broken that cycle and we're not returning bio-based material back to the earth for regeneration, natural capital. And currently we're mixing the biomaterials in the technical cycle together so they can't be separated. So that's a little bit of the challenge um, to enable these cycles to flourish. And I promise I'll get to the practical bit really soon. I won't just be Sophie nerding out on um, all things CE, but to, to really get these different cycles to flourish, we need to think about things like the rise of product as a service, application of biomimicry, industrial symbiosis, cradle to cradle design, sharing economy, supply chain traceability, these kind of different ideas that enable different business models to thrive and an economy to function really in a different way than it traditionally has, but also with a very different impact on the planet. So that's the basics of the theory. More practically, um, KPMG and CSIRO worked on a um, little piece of work together where we determined that by embracing a circular economy in Australia, we would expect to see a rise, increase in GDP of 23 billion by 2025, 
And looking further afield to 2050, that number skyrockets to 210 billion in GDP. So that's a massive commercial opportunity here. As much as it is good for the planet, it's also really good for the economy and for startups to be able to, to capitalize and, and get a market share in that. I think one of the other really important things to mention here is the connection between circular economy and the net zero transition. Because everybody's very excited about all things net zero, um, decarb targets, carbon offsets. Um, but when we really think about the efforts to date in terms of tackling climate change and decarbonizing the grid, it's, it's all about the transition to renewable energy, which is very important, don't get me wrong. But research from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and other global leading bodies worldwide have found that when you think about in emissions portfolio, roughly 55% of that is the energy. Now that's sort of averaged across all sectors. So, you know, there's gonna be ebbs and flows in every sector, but just over half of that is your energy emissions. The other 45% that comes from all of the goods and the products that are within your supply chain and all of that embodied carbon. And so when we think about actually trying to meet some of these net zero targets that have been put out, you're not gonna be able to do that exclusively on energy transitions alone. And so that's where we really need to think about how we're producing cars, how we're producing clothes, all the products and the embodied carbon essentially tackling scope three. One of the significant ways that we can do that is through application of the principles of the circular economy. Within, with respect to legislation, um, I would say traditionally, Australia has, you know, at the state level, been very focused on the waste resource recovery side of things. Often, you'll see states that have these landfill diversion targets, um, but they, they'll call them circular economy policies. But ultimately, it is a waste diversion or resource recovery policy that then they've just tacked on the circular economy um, framing to it. When in all actual fact. There's no higher order circular strategies in it, but we do, I think we're starting to see some of these enabling conditions for that to change. Federally, we recently saw a target that was put out at the end of November by um, Federal Minister for the Environment, actually at a KPMG event, which was pretty cool, on a target to develop a circular economy in Australia by 2030. And it's a very, very significant step to be taking. Um, and it is expected that following that commitment, there will be a number of different carrot and stick incentives that will be put out into the Australian federal ethos to actually achieve that by 2030. And so we see both a significant opportunity and a potential risk on the track as businesses either progress and make circular movements or they stay in their traditional linear ways and then risk having to have a little bit of a, a scramble as we get to the, the later part of this decade. I will pause there. Uh, that was a bit of a monologue there. So no, it's great. It's great, Sophie. It's really, really interesting, um, and it's great, you know, having sort of that depth of understanding about the whole topic. Um, Charlotte's just thrown a question in there, just saying she's read somewhere that less than ten percent of the, the the economy currently is circular. Is that right? Yes. Um, the so circle economy is a global foundation that sets out the percent circularity of the globe. Um, I will say that I think it's 8.6% that's been determined to be circular. That may be last year's figure, but it, it is under 10%. It actually deteriorated during COVID. We were doing reasonably well and then actually took a step back during, during COVID years, um, which is somewhat expected given the, all the single use PPE that was going around, understandably. Um, so that, that is correct. I see there's also the, the question on the biomimicry, um, which I'll get to that in a second. I think where I would hazard some caution with the 10% figure is largely that's a, that's a marketing tool, right? Like I, I do think for the most part in terms of determining the whole world, there's a lot of assumptions that were made in that. And so I think we wanna take that with a little bit of caution. Mm. The global percent circularity is exceedingly low. Um, but I do think there are certainly pockets and different sectors where that number is significantly higher. So my hat does go off to circle economy though, because that would be a massive behemoth task to determine the global level of circularity. Right. And look, and so obviously with with those sort of targets, government targets, incentives, and now there's that there's this recognition, you know, that's that we've sort of rapidly moved really to this recognition that we need to to change, we need to move, we need to act now. 
Um, so with that, obviously there'll be incentives coming through. There'll be different things that we will start seeing over time. But what would you see are those sort of the sort of the, the key commercial opportunities? I guess that you would be seeing at the sort of earlier phase of that. You know, what, what are you seeing out there now? Yeah, I think it's different models of doing business. So when we think about how we've traditionally done things, it's really about shifting that way that it's always been done to what's the art of the possible for a different model of doing things. So when we think about products as a service, you know, lighting, for example, I think is a really great one. You know, everybody is used to just going out and buying globes to put into their, say, commercial buildings. And it really, we're seeing in, in Netherlands and even here at the moment that that does not have to be the case anymore. People are actually buying subscription services to office lighting. And then the lighting manufacturer is actually responsible, not just for manufacturing those lights, but servicing them. And then when those lights have reached their sort of quote unquote use by date, they will take those lights put them back into their remanufacturing cycle. And then all of those elements of those globes actually become the next set of globes. Not to mention these elements are then, you know, all the inputs are circular and even the packaging. Some of these companies are, have mushroom farms out back in shipping containers where then they're growing all of the packaging for the mushrooms. And this is not just um, sort of small end of town that's starting to do this. The, this, little partnership that I'm referring to right now is actually between Eagle Lighting and Melbourne, who is a, a smaller player, but with Lendlease that they're exploring for their commercial buildings. And so there is significant opportunity here to really rethink the way that we're doing things, but also then the products that are being sold. So there's um, another company, smaller company in Melbourne, and they're taking construction waste, repurposing it, crushing, washing, sorting, and then selling it back into the construction sector. And then that's actually helping with a lot of these construction companies scope to emissions and, and lowering that. Okay, great. But I think, oh, I was just gonna um, add with respect to those commercial opportunities, I think there is a big piece on the investment front that mm. still needs to be addressed here. Um, yeah. So Kylie, giving you a little bit of a segue to, um, I think there's probably an opportunity for Mark to chime in on that as well. Yeah, um, your thoughts on that, Mark? On the need on the need for investment, well, you know, there's certainly opportunity to uh, invest in the circular economy. I think Sophie's really pointed uh, to a few of the key drivers. I think climate. Everyone's heard of climate. Everyone's heard of TCFD. There's lots of reporting around what's your impact on the climate. What are your emissions? The circular economy is the solution for a number of these. And as the big end of town starts setting setting its targets around decarbonizing its supply chains that gives rise to the need for solutions and the need for for changing business models and the circular economy and that, that, that a new way of thinking about supply chains and, and and the value in natural resources becomes all the more prevalent and I think as soon as as soon as that business case can be unpacked and communicated well investors are very keen to in, to invest in, in in these solutions so we, there's you know a number of uh, super funds have got decarbonisation targets themselves, they're, and they're also they're looking to decarbonise they decarbonise their investment portfolio, but also invest in positive solutions. So you know, both 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 sides of that investment decision are being being approached, and I think circular economy has a number of you know, great things to offer for, for both sides. And, and while we're on that investment piece, and maybe for you as well, Sophie, I, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that at sort of the early phase of this, you know, like some of these solutions are going to be at a higher cost, you know, so um, what are you seeing in terms of the response either from, a, a, you know, a, an end customer willing to engage if the cost is higher than, you know, a cheap disposable sort of approach? Um, and also with investors, the, the sort of the understanding of investors and, and the willingness to commit to that and invest in that, mm. that for a, a better forward path. But that, that's the great question. I think a lot of the technology is nascent. It's not to scale and therefore it is, it's test bed and it's pilot at yeah. the first stage. Um, but I think a number of larger players understand that things have to change. So by 2030, status quo will not be good enough. And if you, if you haven't invested now, you won't have a social license to operate. We did a, a piece of research around um, uh, ESG 2030, where, in, where we uh, interviewed a number of large corporate players, one of which was um, 
the ESG person at Coles, who said, we've got a lot of supply chain issues that are very difficult and will be expensive for us to solve. However, if we have not solved them by 2030, we're not we're not in the game. So they, you know, there was a, a definite uh, understanding that things have to change and it is it is difficult. So I know there's there's a number of changes and potentially the first that per, first pilot study is more expensive, but it's about learning for the future. But on the flip side, I, I do a lot of work with a company called Brambles, who are the world's most circular company. And they have just issued a, a circular bond just earlier this week. It's the first in Australia for 800 million Aussie dollars. And they got a significant discount at, for, at their um, at their rate for that for that debt on the back of the bond and the the use of proceeds being for circular economy. So this is yeah. You know, once you've had the, the ability to scale up a business and you can communicate the benefits to your your customers and your investors, the money the money comes in. So it's a, at the maturity level, there's you know there's demonstrable benefits. But understanding that at the the startup level, it's it's often pilot phase and and building building the communications, building the understanding with investors and supply chains of of what you can do and what the benefits look like. Mm -hmm. And, and if we go back to that sort of the, the I guess, how larger organisations are engaging, I mean, that, the Coles example is really interesting. I mean, do you guys have any other insights into that, like what you're seeing at that larger organisation level, how quickly they're moving to this, sort of, you know, some more examples of the kinds of things they're doing and where they're willing to make a commitment? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think there's a significant part of it you can kind of group them into almost, you know, two camps in terms of the, the bigger end of town, there's those that are really hyperly focused on their net zero commitments. Mm -hmm. And that's where you see them looking at circular initiatives as an opportunity to lower their scope three emissions. Because when we go back to that sort of 55% energy, 45% products breakdown that I mentioned earlier, that's where many of these companies know that they're not gonna be able to offset their way out of their net zero commitments. And so they're looking for tangible elements that they can lower their emissions and, and that's where it comes into play. Then I would say typically though, those are the smaller, less systems change elements. Whereas if we're looking at the second camp of the big end of town, that's actually looking at embracing more of the sort of system that their own business operates in, such as a Brambles, such as, you know, Ikea is looking to be completely circular by 2030. Um, these are big companies that are reinventing the way that their models work such that everything from procurement to how their, you know, employees are coming into the office through to how their customers are actually disposing and the responsibility for the products that they have at the end of the day is within that system. And so you do see particularly the big end of town that has operations in Europe. I think one thing that I did not mention in my sort of beginning preamble is the European Union um, has far more significant and advanced circular economy um, targets and regulation than we do here in Australia, particularly the Netherlands, where by 2050, um, they're going to, the aim is to have a completely circular economy. And so as an interim target to get there, by 2030, the Netherlands has to use 50% fewer primary resources. So that's minerals, metals, fossil fuels, 50% reduction in pretty much all the inputs into the system by 2030. And that's with that, they're requiring mandatory reporting. And so particularly for businesses here that have operations or selling into Europe, there's already a big onus on them to start making those changes because if they don't embrace circularity now, they're going to be, you know, ultimately fined for it or there'll be regulatory implications down the track. And, and I guess it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts on sort of policy here or anything you're seeing coming through in that sort of policy space that, you know, that you can talk about um, but it, like, what's the understanding of where, where we're headed or what are you seeing in terms of where, headed, where we're headed and where you see big changes on the horizon? Well look so much of enough. our economy is focused on mining so I, I don't know if we'll have such a similar <laughs> policy but um, I, I do think that that change is afoot um, as I mentioned some of those enabling factors are, are already happening while there is heaps of space, you know, it's very hard to compare the Netherlands to Australia because there's so many factors that are completely different that I don't think we would follow the exact same trajectory. But ultimately, we have finite resources on the planet. You know, when I think about my sailing days, I know this is a bit of a sort of corny pun here, but when you think about sailing across an ocean on the boat that you're on, you literally only have the food, fuel, tools, water that you've got on that vessel. And that has to last you, you know, if you're 
going across a big ocean at least a month. And ultimately, you don't have any outside help. There's no additional resources that you're going to be able to pump into that boat to be able to get you across. And that's pretty much the same situation that you're in. So what we're, whether you're in the Netherlands and you have finite space, and so they do not have the landfill capacity that we do here, have here in Australia, or you're here, ultimately, we all have the same pool of resources that we're going to have to make do with what we've got. It is a much bigger scale than the sailing analogy and over a much longer period of time. But ultimately, if we keep up with the consumption patterns that we currently have, we will be needing, I always screw up this fact, but you know, it's it's four times the materials that we currently have on the planet to keep up with consumption. And we simply don't have that. And so we're ultimately, whether the policies look very similar to the Netherlands or very different, changes are gonna have to be made because otherwise we'll run out. Yeah. But but are you, are you seeing that, are you seeing any sort of policy shift coming through that will support that? Like when, are, you, are you seeing that happening, I guess at a state level, we're sort of in flux now, but at a, at a federal level, like are you seeing anything that, that you feel positive about that's actually gonna support that? Yeah, so um, so the Federal Minister for the Environment, Tanya Plibersek, has started a circular economy working group off of the back of the target that was set at the end of November. Um, and so that's, I suspect, in the coming months, there will be some regulation to start supporting the targets that they've outlined. I think what they're really trying to do, it sounds like, is take this a step away from the pure waste and resource recovery front, because while that is a core element of this, and there is a significant capital investment piece, as Mark was mentioning, um, I think there is the ambition, or at least I hope there is the ambition to take a step beyond. All of our state-based policies are very waste focused, as I mentioned. And um, what the point of the working group, from my understanding is, is to try and look a little bit beyond that. How can we start supporting the systems that will actually, and provide the prevailing environment for more of these circular business models and policies to flourish down to the state level as well. Mm, okay. Um, and Mark, just back to the investment piece, um, I guess um, because you're operating, you're operating more broadly across that sort of whole ESG and responsible investing space, um, I guess any sort of insights from you in terms of what um, a leading investor is starting to consider regarding circular economy and some of the benefits they associate with it? Just on mute, Mark. From an investment point of view, um, circular economy is certainly seen as a as a driver of resilience of supply chains. So the the idea that if you are more circular, your business is more circular, your your supply chains will be more resilient than than if they're not. That gives you a certain cost advantage and a certain sort of, uh, understanding and sort of certainty around where your your supply chains are coming from, and also through your value chains. If they're more circular you're building better relationships through your customers and you're, you're you're building resilience through those those elements i think circular economy is still nascent in the investment space there are a few impact investors who are definitely targeting circular economy opportunities and we're seeing that linked to sort of um, impact investors or sdg sdg specific investments so there there are some that are out there identifying some specific ce elements but I think the longer term view and certainly the, the view of the private equity house that I work with is the co-benefits and thinking of thinking about the, the issues of bigger business or of the economy and designing the solutions that will win over the, the, the short, medium, longer term around that. So uh, I think we will, and, and pointing back to, to Sophie's uh, sailing analogy, when we get closer to those resource end points or, or when resources become more restricted the policy response will become much more aggressive and much more much more speedy so i think we're in the at the moment where we're it's almost a false dawn where we understand that there is issue around resource availability and it will come a point where resources are not available or become so become so expensive that that it's or, or so threatened that the policy has to step in and we, we will then at that point see a, a very strong policy response in in my opinion so those who are those who are thinking logically medium long term can see that coming and are preparing and, and making some some investments around the solutions and around supply chain resilience and availability into the future so I think that, yeah, that's the that's the sort of longer, you know, mid longer term investment strategies that, that 
that some of the houses are coming up with now. Okay, and, and I know that we had a question about, about metrics and we talked about this sort of, you know, over the week and said, you know, like this, it's not like you have a, a metric that you can target when you, as a startup going out looking for investment, um, but, but where, where do you see, you know, what do you see as the key drivers um, in terms of, you know, what investors and sustainability markets are looking for and how should startups be thinking about that? What, how should they, how can they put a lens on that so that when they're talking to somebody, they're talking about the right things? That's yeah. a, a very good question. I'll, can I have a swing at that, Sophie, and I'll, I'll hand over to you. I think, I think at the moment, across the whole ESG space, there are very few recognised metrics. Carbon, yes, there, there is a carbon metric. But many, for many other topics, the, the actual metrics and measurements are emerging. The EU have developed a set of metrics that are, that are interesting around circularity and around a number of other topic areas. I think we'll see that increase. And I think we'll see a maturity around reporting. But at the moment, as we stand, um, a well thought through business model that can talk about the, the potential benefits for customers or through the supply chain, even in a narrative form, is good. The development of your own metrics that you're thinking about, you know, what, what is your, what is your, um, your business proposition? What is the, the issue that you're trying to solve? And starting to measure the impact around that. Again, with using bespoke bespoke measurements and measures that you can you can design yourself is a good starting point but it's around the consistency of thinking and the consistency of approach which is very important much better off to, to have a couple of metrics that are that are very consistently applied within your own business and condemn you can link your own value creation to that than pick up a reporting framework that is off to one side or you know it's got green ticks associated with it I think tell your story consistently and, and, and tell it appropriately. Did you have something to add there, Sophie? Yeah, I'll just chime into a little bit on what some of the circular metrics are that are emerging. But to Mark's point, you know, they are not consistent across Australia or the globe. And, and they're often, I think, they're not as sophisticated as the carbon metrics are. You know, there is not the level of adaptation and universalness of, you know, scope one to three as there is in the circular economy space. So we do have circulitics, um, circular transition indicators, and a number of other smaller ones that are starting to pop up. And those are really looking at the inputs and the outputs of either at the product level or at the business level in terms of base, it's basically a landfill diversion measure, right? How much of it is actually going back into the system. And that's similar to how the circle economy global figure was derived in terms of the inputs in, and then was it going to landfill? Was it being recycled or was it going back into the system? Um, if you also look at it from a LCA measure, so life cycle assessments are a really common measure of circularity, and that's really looking at the impacts more broadly across many different impact categories, because often what we do see in the circular economy with a circular product is sometimes the emissions for a circular product are actually higher than virgin extraction. And so that's where when you're doing an LCA, you're looking at all of the different impacts categories so that the story is wider than just oh my carbon emissions are this because ultimately when you take into consideration that sort of first life then transportation and then any of the recovery elements to the second life there is going to be higher emissions and that's that's a fact of the matter but when you look at the overall picture and the other impact categories that does tell a very different story you can also look at things like materials flow analyses and then increasingly avoided emissions is becoming um, a hot topic where particularly if you're in circular procurement or choosing a circular product if you look at that product relative to the virgin side of things you can um, sometimes measure some some really interesting elements but I do think this also comes back to a bit of a greenwashing risk as well and so you just want to be careful to Mark's point about finding a measure and sticking with it that's the most relevant for your company and telling that consistent story will you know if, if you do that right um I think you just need to be very, very conscious of, of the greenwashing risk and, and not overselling it because regulators are all over this at the moment as they should be. That's a good point. And Sophie, could I just, I mean, my, my understanding of, of VC and of startups would be that potentially you're looking to solve that circularity or improve that circularity performance in your customer. So it's almost, if your customers are beginning to think about their own circularity, yeah. you need to go, you can go to them and you can say, well, I've got product X that can help you improve your score. So yeah. hel helping the, 
helping the large listed or, or the you know the, the company that has the brand and the brand promise or has the, the circularity problem taking them a solution exactly. the circularity metric itself might not be relevant to your own business but, but to have an understanding of exactly having a we were working with a small company in, in Melbourne, the construction waste company I was talking about, and, and they were really key on understanding for specific product categories, what both the carbon emissions, but then the larger ecological impact on that product was, not for their own awareness, but so that when they were selling back into the construction sector, they could market it to the big end of town as, you know, this is a product that's going to help your own emissions, your own X, Y, and Z. And so there is that really poignant element there. But I do think there's the potential for a number of circular models and offerings that don't fall neatly into that when we think about the different tech platforms or tools or products as a service that don't necessarily have, it's not the manufacturing side or the product side. You know, if you're providing a software platform to help enable the circular transition, um, there is not the level of sophistication in the CE metrics world at this point to measure how that impact is going to more broadly help drive a circular future. Okay, um, and and back to that point that you know we you mentioned earlier, you know, that one of the challenges with circular economy is it's kind of seen as recycling and waste reduction. Um, like, how do, how do you get how do you get that bigger story out, or what do you think is going to happen to actually? build that story more effectively to understand, I guess, the, the scale of what circular economy actually entails. Do you see anything happening around that or do you see some sort of momentum there to, to get that awareness up? Oh, that's a hard one. Um, I think in part this comes down to the market, right? We do not have a charismatic megafauna as the poster child in circular economy, right? Like there's no cute turtles or koalas that um, the natural capital guys have. <laughs> but I think this really does come down to, to two elements. There's the cultural piece, and then there's the infrastructure piece that kind of feed into the education that needs to happen in the overarching system to be able to really affect this change. And so, you know, I, I think the cultural piece is starting to change, but that that doesn't happen overnight. You know, when we think about extending the life cycle and the use of, of a phone, you know, Apple is gonna have to make some pretty significant changes so that, you know, a phone doesn't go out of fashion in, you know, a year and a half, two years time so that you're going to buy another one, but rather we're extending the use of the phone and then we've got the infrastructure to actually recover the materials that are in the phone. And that brings me to that sort of the process piece. We don't actually have a lot of the infrastructure at this point for some of those advanced recycling and remanufacturing processes that are required. We do see them at bits in different sectors. So take um, Komatsu, for example, in the mining sector, all of Komatsu's heavy machinery that goes into the mining sector, something like 99% of it goes back into its own operations. And so we do see these pockets where the infrastructure and the systems are there, but as a whole, that 10% figure that was referenced earlier really I think does speak to the point that we don't have the infrastructure at this point to be able to, to really support the advanced recovery that we will need. And so I think that's that's part of the problem is, is those two elements, but more broadly, I think there is an education piece. You know, it's, it's about designing the systems. It's not just about putting something in the right bin. It's about, it's about all the other elements. Hmm. And, and, and the greenwashing thing is such a big issue. I mean, what, what advice have you got to anyone in terms of, you know, like how they should be thinking about what they're presenting or what they're talking about? when they are talking to investors or customers to really make sure that they are not ending up in that greenwashing bucket? Like, you know, what, what are some of the precautions they can take? Don't, over, don't overstate what you're doing. Yeah. I, think, I think most, most people know. You know, yeah. you know greenwashing is not, is not hard. It's not if, if you're gonna, if you're gonna yeah. make statements, make sure you can, you can apply them or you can support them understand your entire business. I think for, for startups, that's more simple. I think greenwashing is probably less of an issue. If, if we're working with multinationals, if you're making statements around your carbon emissions in one place, you maybe there's something going on in another jurisdiction or another region that you're not aware of. But I think for, for startups, that's a much lower risk. But I think just be careful not to overstate the, the credentials of your service or, or your, your product. Okay, um, and we've got some questions. Um, so, so I've just lost my chat. Oh, there we go. Totally lost my chat. 
Um, so Bob from Veritas, um, did you want to come off mute, Bob, just to ask your questions? Uh, yes, yeah, okay. that's much better, much yeah. easier. <laughs> so, thanks, Mark. Yeah, just uh, uh, so actually, uh, interesting to, to see your experience, also the insight you have. That's actually exactly what we are trying to do. So we are a te technology startup. We are engineers and scientists, and we want to solve the problem using technology. Um, but it's very difficult to find customers um, who really want to do pilot with us. Um, we are building technology using AI, like a blockchain essentially to address the greenwashing issues. And we even got funding from the US Foundation. So money is not a problem for us, but customer is, right? Is uh, how you actually have the customers to really want to try this. Um, I mean, that's probably human nature. If you, I spoke to some customer, uh, I want to solve the greenwashing issue for you. And then they just walk away. Um, mm -hmm. It's either they are scared or they're not interested or they probably don't see the value. So how do you see this? Uh, finding the customer and then how to how to onboard them. Thanks. Um, look, it's a it's a good question. I mean, Sophie and I have been doing our ESG sustainability stuff for a long time, and it's you know, we hear, we have the same we have the same questions. I think uh, the language of circularity in greenwashing is still new. I, I think people are still learning and trying to understand it at, at the moment. Certainly something I'm seeing with my clients is the finance guys are getting much more involved now with ESG reporting and it has a risk. So I think yeah, ESG, but whatever, whatever particular topic it is within that is is gradually increasing in importance in the business. And it is finding supporters and homes in finance and treasury now, which I think is a massive step change. But there is a language deficit. There's a there's a, a misunderstanding. It's a, it's a new risk class, and I think it's an, it's a new financial class. And I think the language to support that is still developing. Um, it, but it is but it is coming. If that's any if that's any consolation, it, it is coming. But pilots and new things are always tricky. Aren't they? They're, they're always difficult to, to to get set up. I think to Mark's point about the risk, I think it is framing it as, you know, presenting the risk down the line. Like when, when Mark and I do a materiality workshop to identify an entity's top material topics, you know, when we're thinking about those short, medium, long-term risks, ultimately the company is trying to make sure that they can stay off of the front page of the paper for the negative impacts, right? And so I think if, if you're able to position the tool as something that's helping them identify those risks to prevent them down the track. Um, I could, there's, I think some, some potential there to, to have a poignant pitch. And, and anyone else on the call with other questions around, um, I guess the challenges you're seeing or like what, what are the biggest challenges you guys are seeing? Hyper-focus on emissions. <laughs> oh, Sophie, I, th I think that's, you know, I think that's going to be a driver. I think emissions first, let people get their head around that. And yeah. I think as soon as they start, you know, as, as these targets begin to bite, circularity is, is a superb solution. So I, I, think, I think it will definitely come. I think um, the TNFD, the, the Task Force on Nature Related Financial Disclosures, will be another one that drives mm -hmm. resource use you know, up the charts. And so I think, I think it will definitely come. I really do. And we've got the IWSB, the, the International Sustainability Standards Board, have produced one stat on, standard on climate. Nature will be next. And I think you know, circular economy reporting will not be far behind that either. The Europeans already are reporting against it. So I, I, think, it, I think it will come. I, I really do. And there's a question there. Um, yeah, so from um, Jess Evans. So, um, so you mentioned the EU's progressive policies, but in other regions like MENA and, and Asia, have you seen any significant policy shift towards CE and investment in the required infrastructure? Absolutely. So actually, I would say um, particularly China's national sword policy was actually really what spurred Australia to start even thinking about our waste and circular economy, because when China and other um, countries stopped accepting Australia's waste. We actually had to deal with it on our shores and started having to address not only where it was actually going to go, but 
does it, the system need to even be this way such that we're creating this waste to then have to ship overseas? And so absolutely, China's been investing quite heavily and they've got a number of different, um, obviously the, the five-year plans, I think this is, there's been like 14 circular economy five-year plans that have been updated with increasing ambition over the years. So there's certainly um, a, a very big focus in China and you start to see I actually used to work um, with, did a documentary with National Geographic in the Philippines, because um, one of the big issues there is that there's one of the, they're one of the highest ocean polluting countries, just given that all of the, the waste washes from the rivers, particularly in the big cities, into the ocean, given that a lot of their systems are based around small packaging, given the socioeconomic status of many people, you're buying, you know, a toothpaste container in what most in Australia would buy is their, their travel size packet that's the stock standard for most in the Philippines. And then you've got a sort of order of magnitude volume of waste that's going into, there's, there's no infrastructure, materials or processing facilities to actually process that waste. And so there are some shifts happening there as well um, in terms of actually the broader system. And there's some really cool PPPs that are happening in these countries where industry is actually working with government to not formally take on more of that extended producer responsibility, but informally through these PPPs and investment in that infrastructure. It is starting to happen, but I think the most organized one we see at the moment is, is the policy coming out of China. Interesting. And, and out of interest, you know, like countries like Indonesia that have had, you know, such massive, massive issues with, with waste for so long, what, what sort of moves are you seeing in those, those sort of, I guess, those economies where it was, they required such a massive, massive shift and the problem is huge. Are you seeing much happening across many of those um, those other countries that that you know have been slow to move in the past? I am not a policy expert in <laughs> Southeast Asian, yeah. so I just want to flag that. But I, yeah. I think what's exciting to see is actually some of the social enterprises and startups that are coming out of some of these Southeast Asian countries, particularly some of the work that Plastic Bank, while they are um, more Canada and US focused, a lot of the programs that they're doing and partnering with various entities on the ground in terms of adding a putting a dollar value on plastic. And so they're actually working with a number of banks and um, low-income communities to pick up the waste. And then basically through different tagging and tech processes, they're essentially creating these online bank accounts for people to be able to tag that trash in responsibly dispose of it or put it back into the system for either waste to energy or different reprocessing elements and then actually earn an income that way. So I think there's a lot of cool different small models that are starting to emerge out of these countries that um, if they had been the policy to help back some of this up could really lead to some significant impact moving forward. Great. And there may be some significant policy in Southeast Asia that I'm not fully across. So <laughs> so Sorry, I shouldn't, I shouldn't be jumping the gun and asking you policy questions. Um, and so, so anything, I mean, I, I, I haven't got any new questions in there. If anyone wants to jump in with anything else, feel free. Um, but in the meantime, unless I've missed any, Charlotte, so sing out if I've missed any questions through there. But in the meantime, is there anything, I guess, in sort of like wrapping up with um, you, Sophie and Mark, that you would sort of want to throw in or add? I would say if your startup thinking about CE, put together the measure or the, you know, think about the impact that you can have on your customer base in terms of solving their circular economy issues. Start to measure, you know, even if you're designing your own metrics that, that can sort of have that, that knock-on effect uh, in your customer base, start to measure that now. Set out your strategy clearly using um, circular economy as a driver and a, and a driver of value, think about the metrics that your customers are, are measuring and how you can help them manage their own circular risks or their, or their resource use risk and measure that over a period of time so you can start you know, measuring your progress and you've, you've got a consistent and good story to tell when you're coming for your next round of funding, be that to, to private equity, IPO, or whatever that might be. That's sort of a history of progress and a, with a good consistent data set is is highly valuable and Sophie I think it's really the opportunity to do something different and then to have an economic paradigm to back you up um, I think that's probably the most exciting thing for me if I was in the startup world is you know you've really got almost like this 
global thought idea that everybody's excited about at the moment that you can tap into and help amplify your own story and then have that be the driver as, as you progress forward. And, and it's not only good for the environment, but it's it's good for the pocketbook and commercials. And so I think, you know, the opportunity to be able to, to really have a totally different model. I think we haven't, there's not too many points in history other than, you know, industrial revolution, tech side of things, and now really reinventing the way we do business under a circular economy paradigm is massively exciting and what um, really gets me out of bed in the morning. So that's, that's the only thing, you know, be bold out there, guys. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Um, look, look, I mean, I think if that's everything, if no one's got any other questions, we can probably start wrapping up. Um, look, really appreciate your time, Sophia and Mark. It's just, it's great sort of being able to get these guys access to you. Um, we'll actually take some notes and share this afterwards for those that couldn't make it as well. Um, but really appreciate you guys contributing and taking the time to do this. Um, and thanks, Charlotte, for setting everything up and organising this all. Um, and then for everybody else on the call, I mean, we're, we're obviously doing these once a month. Next next month, we're actually going to go into sort of some more like a finance kind of how do you set up a finance, um, think about, you know, a finance function that works for a startup that's about to scale. So we've got some of our teams from our outsource finance, so our people from our outsource finance team that will jump on and actually talk you through how you sort of start small and then grow from there and, and develop your finance function. Um, so we'll send some info about that. But at all times, anything, anytime you guys want more info or you want to get access to this sort of expertise, we're really open to you reaching out and letting us know what it is you're looking for so that we can just try and tailor this to according to what you what's going to help you and help you grow your business. Um, so I think that's all from us. Um, anything for you, Charlotte? No, thank you so much for your attention. It was so great to go that deep dive and the, I think I asked that question, what excites you most about the circular economy opportunity? And you perfectly answered that, uh, Sophie and Mark. It's, um, it is what gets you out of bed in the morning and it's what gets a lot of our founders out of bed too. It's um, such a great time we have right now that there is excitement, there is customer understanding and as, as well as demand. So now is the time. Thank you so much for your time today.